So welcome everyone. Uh, I think we all know why we're here. Uh, this is a, a special um, special gathering for Peter's 70th birthday. I remember when Peter turned 60, which is Babylonian 10, right? Uh, we had to travel uh, to Israel and then to China and then to Princeton. So now we can all sit from the comfort of our homes and uh, enjoy some, some nice reminiscences and conversations and uh, show our appreciation to Peter for all that he's done for all of us. I'm sure I don't speak for uh, just myself. So for this honor, we're very glad to have Professor Zev Rudnick from Tel Aviv University. Um, he is the, um, the, the beer chair in number theory at Tel Aviv. He received his PhD from Yale and was a postdoc at uh, Zego assistant professor at Stanford, and then was an assistant professor at Princeton before moving to Tel Aviv, and then many other honors and awards, but uh, I, I won't uh, go on with that today. We'll just uh, hear from, from Zev, and uh, please, Zev, take it away. Okay, thank you, Alex. So it's a pleasure to um, speak on Peter's 70th birthday. Um, I had a, a, a vague plan to, uh, to make a retrospective of all of Peter's work in the first 70 years and, and then realized very quickly that it was a foolish idea. And I'm going to concentrate on some aspects of his work um, on automorphic forms and only on classical automorphic forms, uh, by which I mean either classical modular forms, which I will I, I do think most everyone knows what they are, and then uh, the more exotic mass waveforms. And I feel that I should recall the definition of a modular form, uh, even though I expect everyone to know it. And then while thinking of how to define it, I said, Let, let's have Peter do that. So um, I, found... I really can't explain what a modular function is in one sentence. I can try and give you a few sentences to explain. <laughs> I, I really can't do it in one sentence. Oh, it's impossible. Okay, that wasn't very good. Uh, so let's try. <laughs> let's try to recall the definition. Um, so a classical modular form is a holomorphic function on the upper half plane, which satisfies a lot of functional equation under the modular group, or equivalently it's periodic, and then is transforms in a certain way under the uh, Mobius reflection. So these are two of the conditions, and there's a third one, which is a little more complicated to explain, which is uh, holomorphic at infinity. And what that means is uh, you map the upper half plane to the punctured unit disk by taking um, tau, the upper half plane variable, to e to the 2 pi i tau, which is called q, the gnome. And then the periodicity condition on the function implies, among other things, that the, the modular form is only a function, depends only on q, on this new variable, and that as a function of q, it's analytic in the image of the upper half plane, so in the punctured unit disk. And holomorphic at infinity means that we require this new function to have an analytic continuation at the origin. And, and then if you look at the Taylor series of this new function of Q, this is called the Fourier expansion of the modular form. This is uh, what a lot of time encodes the important arithmetic information in the shape of the coefficients, these Fourier coefficients. Then the last definition is uh, what it means to be cuspidal. It means that this uh, new function of Q vanishes at the origin equivalently, equivalently that the um, period of the modular form is zero. So that's the definition of modular form and classical cusp form. Um, so I'll denote by M of K the space of modular form of weight k and inside it is the subspace of cus forms of co-dimension one typically. And um, 
modular forms have a topological origin and uh, the dimension grows linearly with k, the dimension grows like k over 12 plus uh, bounded quantity. So the classical examples are Eisenstein series. So you just take uh, something and periodicize it. And then by definition, essentially, it's a modular form of weight k. And then the Fourier expansion of the Eisenstein series is clearly of arithmetic origin. The coefficients are essentially divisor sums. So it's uh, a non-cuspital modular form of weight k. And then you can write the space of modular forms as multiples of the Eisenstein series plus cusp forms. Another uh, example is the modular discriminant. It's the unique cusp form of weight 12. Uh, it can be defined by this uh, infinite product, which clearly has an integer Fourier expansion. From this form, it's not at all obvious that it is a modular form of weight 12, but it is. And then another important source of examples are so-called Hecke eigenforms. Um, uh, and one way of defining them is uh, saying that the Fourier coefficients are multiplicative, in fact, uh, satisfy a slightly uh, more stringent requirement that uh, it's called the Hecke relations, which I've written down here. But when m and m are co-prime, it reduces to multiplicativity. So for instance, the modular discriminant is a Hecke eigenform. The coefficients are multiplicative in this sense. Again, this is not at all obvious to me. And another example is the Eisenstein series. The, the divisor sums um, satisfy this uh, Hecke relation. So these are classical modular forms. I, I think everyone knows them. Uh, there's another class of automorphic forms, of classical automorphic forms called mass cusp forms. And these, I think, were very obscure um, to most number theorists until uh, Peter started uh, proselytizing for them. Peter, among other people, but he, he was really instrumental in this. So what's the definition? So we again look at functions on the upper half plane, but instead of being holomorphic, we require them to be eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, of the hyperbolic Laplacian. So that in particular implies that they are real analytic and they are modular forms of weight zero. So they, they are invariant and the Mavis transformations for the modular group. And then cuspidal means that the zeros Fourier coefficient vanishes. And they have a Fourier expansion, which is similar to the Q expansion of classical modular forms, except instead of the uh, function e to the 2 pi i tau, you get something a little more exotic in the y variable, where there's a k Bessel function in there, whose parameter is related to the Laplace eigenvalue. Now, I, I wrote down a definition, but it's not. It, it's not really easy to write down examples of these definitions. Um, and I said that holomorphic modular forms exist for topological reason. I said that the space of modular forms as dimension which grows linearly with the K. Uh, existence of mass forms is a more delicate question. So I wrote down I, I wrote down a definition, but it's not clear that I can produce examples. Uh, now for Congruence, certain congruence subgroups of the modular group already mass constructed such mass cusp forms. Um, but that construction doesn't work for the full modular group. And it is only thanks to Selberg that we know that these exist. Selberg showed that mass cusp forms exist by using a counting argument, uh, which is called Weyl's law. He proved Weyl's law for for mass, for mass cusp forms on SL2Z. And the same, and likewise, for the existence of mass cusp form for any congruent subgroups. Um, and the, the reasons that you can prove existence are arithmetic in nature. In particular, the uh, invented is uh, the famous Selberg trace from line part for this reason. And, um, uh, to establish the existence of a mass form, you need uh, 
arithmetic information, in particular the connection to the theory of L functions, and then some information about the distribution of zeros of, of uh, L functions, Dirichlet L functions. Anyway, this this is just to say that existence of mass cast form for SO2Z is a fact, but it's not a trivial fact, and I can't write down examples in a simple way. I'm going to return to this theme in, in a minute. Now, if you replace the modular group by some other discrete subgroup, which has a non-compact fundamental domain, but is not arithmetic, it is not known if there are any mass cusp forms. And if there are, how many there are? So the, that counting argument, the vilo that I alluded to is not known there. So for instance, if we look at what are called the Hecke groups, so there are groups generated by the standard reflection and by a translation, not by one, but by twice cosine two pi over Q, where Q is an integer. So here is the fundamental, half of the fundamental domain for this Hecke group. So it has, uh, it's a hyperbolic triangle with base angles uh, pi over two, pi over Q and zero. And these are non-arithmetic groups. I haven't defined what arithmetic means. Uh, unless Q is three, four, six, when Q is three, you get the modular group. So uh, for Q equals three, we know that the mass cast forms, I said that Selber proved the existence, but if Q is not one of these three numbers, uh, we don't know that. And it was, believed that mass cast forms had to exist. It was, um, it was called the rolke selber conjecture, and then at some point uh, it became Rolke's conjecture. And uh, one of the uh, fundamental insights that uh, Peter had in his work with Ralph Phillips is that uh, they probably don't exist unless there's an arithmetic reason. Um, so, uh, following works by a series of work by Ralph Phillips and Peter Sarnak, and then uh, by Scott Wolpert and Wenji Luo, and very recently, relatively recently, by Luc Hiare and Chris Judge, uh, it's now reasonable to believe that for non arithmetic groups, few mass cast forms exist. I actually don't quite understand the exact formulation of that. So people, uh, Peter is allowed to interject and give an exact formulation if he can drag himself off the beach in the Caribbean to do that. In any case, I think- I'll that, skip, I'll skip. <laughs> you'll skip, you'll skip, you're going something, okay. <laughs> so the challenge is to, uh, to, prove, to prove this. So um, Chris Judge and Luc Hiliare proved the toy mod, a toy um, case of this that uh, Peter uh, challenged them to. But I, as far as I know, uh, this what I stated as a conjecture is still open. So for the for these Hecke triangle groups, whether they are whether there exist mass cast forms. Okay, so I was saying that mass cast forms are mysterious objects and I can't write them down. And uh, th there's, uh, for me, a very um, beautiful uh, insight of Peter's of how to ask this in a precise form. And the, the, the question in this, in this special context of the modular group asks, can I write down a mass cast form which has integer coefficients? like the modular discriminant or the Eisenstein series. And what Peter proved is that you cannot do that. So there are no Hecke mass cast forms. So there are no mass cast forms with multiplicative coefficients for SO2Z whose coefficients are integers. Um, now, if so I think part of the 50% the of the work here is to think to ask this question. And then if you know what the Langland program predicts, then the answer is clearly no. There, there cannot be any. On the other hand, uh, we don't have the Langland program, so we don't know the Ramanujan conjecture for these, and we don't know the Sato-Tate conjectures for these mass forms. But um, 
Peter was able to use substitutes for these to, to deduce what I, I wrote down here in a very special case. Okay, so now I want to move to a different question on mass forms, which is uh, uh, Peter's work on quantum unique ergodicity. So this is something that uh, we originally formulated oh so long ago in a very general context for eigenfunctions of Laplacian on any negatively curved, let's say, compact manifold. But it, it makes sense to ask this for mass cast forms. So uh, now the, the correct formulation of quantum unique ergodicity is more complicated than I want to, to give here. Uh, but a poor man's version is the following. So you take your a sequence of mass cast forms for the full modular group. So the eigenfunctions of Laplacian. Um, and take a sequence where the eigenvalue goes to infinity. Now, Selberg guarantees for us that there are such, there is such a sequence. And then the quantum unique ergodicity conjecture is that the measures defined by, by taking the density against the hyperbolic measure as the square of this mass form, so that these measures converge to the hyperbolic measure as the Laplace eigenvalue uh, grows to infinity. So this is the quantum unique ergodicity conjecture. I should emphasize that it is still open. It's still open. Um, and I want to explain a little bit more about this QE conjecture by specializing it to a more classical subject, which is a, a version of this for holomorphic modular forms and, and then some elementary applications. Okay, so the version for holomorphic modular forms is, is very similar. Uh, so you take a sequence. Okay, so now it's a definition, it's not a conjecture. So the definition is you take a sequence holomorphic cast forms of increasing weight, and you say that it satisfies QUE, quantum unique ergodicity, if for every compact subset of the fundamental domain, the measures defined by taking the square of this holomorphic cast form converge to the hyperbolic measure. Or well, equivalently, uh, well, this is what I said, if you test it against uh, your favorite nice test function, which is orthogonal to the constant, and the, these periods should tend to zero. So this is the formulation of holomorphic quantum unique ergodicity. Now, I, 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 it's a definition, it's not a conjecture, because it depends on the sequence. So some sequences will satisfy, may satisfy this, and some may not. And because the space of holomorphic cast forms is very big, it just said its dimensionality grows linearly with k, there are certainly subsequences which we can write down uh, which violate QUE. But there are some special interesting sequences where QUE does hold. And a very important case is um, of Hecke eigenforms. So this was proved by Olovinsky and Sound uh, about 15 years ago or so or even longer. Um, right, I'm not responding to the chat because uh, it's hard to see, but if people have questions, uh, they're welcome to interject. I, I'm, I'm, I actually prefer listening to questions than to lecture. So let me describe what goes into QE for Hecke, holomorphic Hecke eigenforms. Um, so uh, what is Q, what was holomorphic QE? You take a, now your favorite test function and consider this its integral against these measures defined by the squares of the cast forms, and you want this integral to go to zero as long as the test function is orthogonal to the constants. Now, in the case when the test function and the cast forms are Hecke eigenforms, 
in their, in their respective domains. There's a beautiful formula that was envisioned by Peter and was uh, uh, proved by Peter's student, Tom Watson, which relates the square of this period to the special value of an L function, to the value of a, a degree six, a GL six L function at the center of the critical strip. So it says that the square is one over K, which is great. We want this to go to zero. So one over K is, is, is fantastic, times the special value, the central value of this um, exotic L function. So in order to prove QE, what we all we need to know is that this central value grows slower than K. K is the parameter of the modular form, the cusp form, which appears here. Phi, the test function is fixed. The only growing thing is the weight of the cusp form, of the holomorphic cusp form. Now, if we look at what we know from the theory of L functions, there's a classical bound that you can get for, L, for the central values, which is called the convexity bound. And it says uh, roughly, so I, I'm lying through my teeth here, but not, not in a serious way. It says roughly that the central value of this particular family of L function is bounded by K. And we are dividing by K, so we just miss uh, tending to zero. On the other hand, uh, the Riemann hypothesis uh, implies what's called the Lindelof hypothesis, which says that this central value is essentially bounded as a function of k, and then we're in great shape. This will say that this, the square of the period is essentially 1 over k, and so it certainly goes to 0. So once you have Watson's formula, you know that the Riemann hypothesis implies QE. Now, you don't really need the Riemann hypothesis. You need something much less. You just need something, a growth, that the growth of the central value is smaller than k, let's say k to the one minus delta. So this is called subconvexity. Um, and unfortunately, it's still unknown. Uh, subconvexity in the sense that I have described of getting a, a, a bound which is uh, k to a our lesson one is still unknown in this case. Anyway, this, this problem and other problems spurred a huge burst of activity uh, to establish subconvexity for various families of L functions, and it's still an ongoing activity. Um, but unfortunately, none of, uh, no one has been able to establish subconvexity in the, for this particular family. Um, nonetheless, I was saying that QE for this family was proved by Holovinsky and Sound uh, because they did slightly less than subconvexity, but still enough to show that this tends to zero. Again, I'm lying through my teeth here. Uh, there's all kinds of other factors here which uh, don't allow me to say exactly what, what you proved. But anyway, they, they proved that this period goes to zero. And um, this is a later development that QE, the original QE for Hecke mass forms was proved by Elon Lindenstrauss in the, for groups with compact fundamental domain and then Sound did it for, let's say, the modular group. Now, uh, so th this was a technical slide. Um, Allomorphic QE is, is a little technical to, to formulate, but it has implications to a much more classical subject in the theory of modular forms, which is the distribution of zeros. And this is what I now want to spend the rest of the um, talk about and hopefully finish much earlier than, than uh, the hour. Okay. So, um, so the basic fact about the modular form of weight k is that it has lots of zeros in the fundamental domain. It's a holomorphic function, and it has about k over 12 zeros. So in fact, the number of zeros, if you count them with some multiplicities, is exactly the dimension of the space of cusp forms of weight k. 
So the question is, where are they located? And I want to discuss the location of these zeros for uh, a number of families of, of uh, modular forms. And uh, so I'll start with Eisenstein series and then describe three more families, uh, depending on how much time I have left. I think I have plenty of time. So the, the first work on this subject uh, was done in the 60s. So at that time, there was uh, people who were looking at zeros of this Eisenstein series, which I described. It. And then the, the people found the zeros of the first uh, of the first Eisenstein series of weight roughly up to 40. Um, so Robert Rankin was very active in this. And then he conjectured that for this Eisenstein series, all the zeros lie on this arc, on the boundary, boundary arc of the fundamental domain. I'm not including the, this, the right half of this arc because it's, it's equivalent under the modular group to the left half of the arc. So he conjectured that all zeros lie there. And then probably within a few days after seeing this or a few minutes, uh, Swinnett and Dyer understood how to prove it. So he and uh, not Robert Rankin, but Fanny Rankin, Rankin's daughter, uh, have a, a very short paper proving that um, the zeros of Eisenstein series all lie on this arc. And in fact, they are uniformly distributed, they are very rigidly spaced here. So this is one example of will of location of zeros of a family of modular forms, Eisenstein series. And there are lots of works of taking this rankin swinnerton and Dyer method and trying to apply it to other families of modular forms. Here's another family, uh, Poincaré series. So Poincaré series, uh, defined very, in a very similar way to Eisenstein series. You take something and sum it over the lattice, over the modular group. Uh, there's a typo here. Um, and uh, so you take uh, k, which is bigger than two, an even integer, and some positive integer m and form this series. When m is zero, we get our Eisenstein series. When m is bigger than zero, you get a new thing, which turns out to be a cusp form, not a, an Eisenstein series, it's a cusp form. And in fact, as you vary m for a fixed k, you get a basis of the space of cusp forms of weight k. So I, I remind you, the, the dimension of the space of cusp form of weight k is k over 12, essentially. So Rankin um, went back to the subject in 82 and, and examined the distribution of zeros of this Poincaré series. And he proved that at least some of these zeros lie on this um, arc on the bottom of the fundamental domain. So precisely at least k over 12 minus m of the zeros lie on this arc. So if n is fixed and k is growing, then it says essentially all the zeros, almost all the zeros lie on the arc. Um, but then uh, very recently, like a few days ago, Noam Kimmel, who is a PhD student at Tel Aviv, asked what happens if you take m to be growing with k, growing linearly with k. And then what Noam discovered is that something completely different happens a positive proportion of the zeros actually lie on the other part of the boundary of the fundamental domain. Uh, and then depending on the ratio between M and K, there will also be zeros on the imaginary axis. Uh, and what's special about these lines, so the, this line the imaginary arc axis and the boundary of the fundamental domain, for all of them, the J invariant is a real number. So these are called real zero. So this is what happens for another family of uh, holomorphic, holomorphic modular forms. So we had Eisenstein series, now we have Poincaré series, which are very similar, but exhibit a different behavior depending on 
the the range of parameters at hand. Now, perhaps sorry, most... sorry, is that proof? Yes. The previous theorem is proved by counting, like like Swinnet and Dyer and Ka. Um, it's it's a little different than Swinnet and Dyer. Um, uh, again, no, I'm, I, the, the idea of Swinnet and Dyer is to take the series and say there's one or two important terms, and the rest are very small. And the important terms uh, give you something that oscillates, and you can count the oscillations. So from that point of view, it's it's the same idea. But here, the oscillations instead of taking part on the boundary on the on the arc, they take part either on the right boundary or on the imaginary axis, depending on the range of parameters. Mm -hmm. So it's the same spirit of idea. Yeah, thanks. Good. Um, and now uh, a much more complicated example is uh, Hecke eigenforms, classical Hecke eigenforms. And then uh, something completely different happens. So instead of the zeros being localized on a one-dimensional set that you can put your hand on, like the bottom of the boundary, the, the bottom of the fundamental domain, or the imaginary axis, or the or the uh, other boundary of the fundamental domain, um, it turns out that as you increase the weight, the zeros become dense. And not only do they the become dense, they become uniformly distributed with respect to the hyperbolic measure. So the, the theorem is, as I stated here, you take a, a sequence of cuspidal Hecke eigenforms of growing weight, and then um, if you fix any nice subset, compact subset of the fundamental domain, then the zeros of each guy, the, each each guy of weight k has about k over 12 zeros, um, the proportion of zeros which lie in this fun, compact subset tends to the relative area of that compact subset. So in particular, that dense. Now, this is something that I realized was true about 25 years ago, following some developments in quantum chaos. And then I, I waited patiently until Watson's formula was written down because once Watson's formula was written down, um, we knew that holomorphic QE follows from GRH. And um, what one shows is that holomorphic QUE, quantum unique ergodicity implies this equidistribution statement. So once Watson's formula uh, I can't say it was published, but it was written down. Uh, uh, we knew that uh, this equidistribution is true. So at it's least. in his thesis, and it's on the archive. Yeah, yeah, I know it's in his thesis. But I said it was never published. <laughs> yeah, right. In any case, I was telling you that Holovinsky and Sound actually proved holomorphic QE without uh, assuming GRH. So this is actually a a. a a theorem now. Now, uh, there, there's a question in the chat about QE for Eisenstein series. I don't know if you want to answer. Yeah, would I expect so Watson's QE point. for I, holomorphic Eisenstein series? So the answer is definitely not. Because yes, you just answered the, the question. Thanks. Because, <laughs> so this is one way. So for the two families I showed earlier, holomorphic Eisenstein series or holomorphic Poincare series, Here's the proof that they don't satisfy QE. I'm not saying it's the best proof, but it is a proof because we saw the zeros don't become dense. They accumulate on a one dimensional set. So we now for free, once we have this for free, we, we know that they don't satisfy QE. Well, what about Poincaré series for associated to geodesics in the modular surface? It's a good question. I don't know the answer. That's a great question. That would be a very nice thing to investigate. What, uh, where do the the zeros lie? That, that would be a great question. I'd Thank you. Be very surprised if the zeros become dense, but I don't know the answer. If anyone has a clue, then uh, shout that. Or we can discuss this uh, in a few minutes if someone is right. So the question is. 
If you take Poincaré series associated to a closed geodesic, I'm not, I'm not defining them. What can you say about the zeros? Good. Right, so uh, Peter and Amit Ghosh went back. So this is a theorem, right? The, the mathematics, it's kind of boring. Once you have a theorem, it's very hard to argue with this, unlike physics. Um, uh, but they still went back to this and um, they asked, okay, what happens not in a fixed compact subset of the fundamental domain? What if you go up towards the cusp? What happens to the zeros? Now, here is a picture of the zeros of a particular Hecke eigenform of weight 2000 by Frederick Stormberg. So, you know, this, this thing has um, about... Uh, 180 zeros or so. Uh, here's a picture of them, and you see that the zeros are sort of dense, at least in the bottom of the fundamental domain. But if you look carefully, you also see a few zeros lying on the boundary of the fundamental domain, and also a few zeros smack on the imaginary axis. And that's kind of surprising, because if the zero is dense, you should think that there's zero probability of them lying on your favorite straight line, on your favorite geodesic. But nonetheless, in the picture, you see this. And then uh, by building a random model, so people who know uh, random polynomials know that they actually have real zeros, surprisingly. They built a random model which predicts that there are actually not so few zeros which lie on these boundary geodesic and on the imaginary axis. So as we said, they're real zeros because the J invariant is real. And so they conjectured that the number of real zeros is about root K log K. Um, there's a precise constant in there. And that once you go sufficiently high up in the cusp, at height slightly bigger than root K, then almost all of the zeros actually are confined to these two geodesics. Uh, this conjecture, as far as I know, is still open. Uh, Peter and Ahmed uh, proved that a lot of zeros actually lie on these vertical geodesics, but not k to the half, but some smaller power of k. And uh, Kaisa Matomaki uh, improved this exponent. But as far as I know, this conjecture, which I think is really beautiful, is still open. And uh, people are welcome to correct me. Right, so uh, we have three families so far of, of, of modular forms where we understand the distribution of zeros. This is Eisenstein series, Poincaré series, and then Hecke eigenforms. And with Hecke eigenforms, there's further questions that you can ask, which are still open. Right, um, and the last example is again very recent. It's from this summer. So I looked at cusp forms, which vanished to very high order at the cusp. So Hecke eigenforms vanish to order one at the cusp. The Q expansion starts with Q. But uh, any cusp, any modular form, first of all, cannot vanish to infinity at infinity to order higher than the dimension of the space of cusp forms. So K over 12, roughly. And it's determined by its first um, L plus one coefficients, L being this dimension. Um, so here's an example of a cusp form. You take a form which all of its in initial coefficients are zero except one. And let's say you take D equals four and you look at form which a uh, form which looks like Q to the L minus four plus uh, everything zero up to the uh, coefficient of q to the l plus one. That uniquely determines, there is a unique, unique such form. Okay, and such a form will have exactly d, these four, let's say, zeros in the interior of the fundamental domain. All the other zeros lie in the cusp. It has a high order vanishing infinity. And then I ask, what can I say about these four zeros? They're not going to be dense anyway, right? There's four points, they're not going to be dense. Um, so here is the result. Uh, let's look at the picture. So uh, 
uh, if, uh, if people can see the colors, uh, the, the color blue here, the four zeros. So this is a particular example here of, of weight um, 1000. So the, that's a unique form of weight 1000, uh, which looks like Q to the whatever, 1000 over 12 minus four plus by all the terms. So it has four zeros, which lie here. And then you increase K, you see, uh, you will see, okay, this, I'm, I'm lying. This is not a picture of what I'm saying. You will see four, four zeros. And what they do is they start creeping towards the cusp, but at a rate which is logarithmic in K. So the, the result is that there are four zeros. I know in asymptotic for the four zeros, the imaginary part uh, looks like log K. And the real part are determined the, in terms of the zeros of the truncated exponential. So here is the truncated exponential. It's a polynomial of degree d. d is 4, let's say, in this picture. It has four inverse zeros. And then the statement is that the zeros of this particular cusp forms are asymptotically given by this formula. So the real part is essentially the argument of this inverse zero of the exponential function. And the imaginary part is a log of the weight. So this is a new, let's call it universality class. So before we had Eisenstein series and Poincaré series, which have zeros um, located, which have real zeros located either on the bottom part of the boundary or on the imaginary axis and on the boundary of the fundamental domain. Uh, for Hecke cast forms, the zeros were dense, uniformly distributed. And for this odd family of examples, this is just a special case of, of, of the theorem. Uh, you have a completely different behavior. You have a finite number of zeros and the zeros you can locate uh, quite accurately and they are none of the, they look different than the other examples. Okay, so these are all examples of questions you can ask about holomorphic modular forms. It's not a dead subject by any means. Um, so, right, so uh, the last thing I want to say is that uh, usually in the birthday, you're supposed to, be, to give presents, right? So we prepare the little present um, for Peter. There's a special volume of the Journal d'Analyse Mathematique, which is coming out now in December. Uh, and several people in the audience have contributed papers, and I think this would be a nice gift for Peter's birthday. So happy birthday, Peter.